Hey folks, it's Tim, aka Turbo B. Today I've got Krillon's 7G10. Now the big news about this light is that it utilizes Cree's um, MT-G2 emitter. The emitter itself is not new, but in terms of flashlight use, it actually is. So I believe this is one of the very first lights that, that does feature this LED along with uh, I think a few of Nightwalker's lights. But before we dive into that, I did want to show off this um, fairly nice sturdy uh, cardboard packaging. It's no longer generic. It does bear the model number now as well as the, um, I'm assuming a serial number or some type of number on the side there. Uh, opening this up, this was provided by um, Mark from MDLightSource.com for review. And he does carry these uh, glow-in-the-dark lanyards, so it's a pretty cool thing if you've never seen it before. I won't be able to capture this on camera because the uh, glow is fairly dim, at least in terms of the camera. But in terms of uh, night-adapted eyes, it's actually pretty cool. Now... The 7G10 does come with a small little accessory package that has uh, spare O-rings and its uh, own land yard as well here. So, and beyond that, it's just, you know, packaging and cushioning. As mentioned, given the LED is the big news here, let's dive into that first. This MT-G2 is a fairly, fairly huge LED emitter. To give you an idea of this, this is through Knight's uh, TN31 here with the XM LED. And even though they're not at the same distance, but you could kind of tell that size-wise, it's just no comparison. I mean, that thing's nearly quadruple the size almost even. This is um, actually Cree's XPG LED, <laughs> which is absolutely minute by comparison, even though this is uh, closer right now. Okay, I do have this zoomed in now for a close-up shot of the um, lens, and again, forgive the banding, but... If you look carefully enough, you will see that it's actually an array of um, very tiny little dyes in there within the this single die, right? So uh, from far away, it does look like it's a single emitter, but in fact, it's actually um, built on an array of minute emitters in there. There is that uh, nice anti-reflective coating, which I assume to be double-sided. It does feature a flat stainless steel bezel. Um, I haven't tried removing it, so I'm not sure if it's removable, but I'll cover that in my written review. One thing I have noticed is that the anodizing does seem to have been improved. Um, it's got this very nice sheen to it. Um, overall, I, I don't see any flaws in it. Like typically, again, with poor anodizing, you would see it um, appear between the crevices, right? You will notice that it's either missing or there's a lighter shade of it, but I'm not detecting that. And likewise, on the sharp corners here, you know, you would notice like bands of it missing as well. So overall, anodizing is quite good. Um, just about near flawless, I would say. Uh, right after the heat fins is the head is removable. Um, but before I get into that, I did want to get back to this thing here. So this is a tripod mount, but unfortunately it was either just not calculated correctly in terms of placement or it was an afterthought because this ledge here from the head itself does interfere with any tripod mount. So at least a standard one. Um, here's a standard one for you. And here's the C. If you dump it here, um, there's really no secure way because the tip of the tripod mount does interfere with the base of the head there. So I'm just really curious as to um, why they designed it this way. Now even if you use one of those um, Go Gorilla pods, it doesn't really quite fit there as well because um, again, it, it's just it sticks out way too far, and this um, head does interfere with the mount. So. Not to say it's impossible, but it is kind of difficult because I did manage to get it on a, um, a tiny little miniature cannon tripod. Now, covering out the rest of the details, it does feature an electronic side switch. Um, it's very soft touch, so it's very actually fairly easy to trigger. And there are these aesthetic grooves here to help with heat dissipation as well. And then finally, we get to the base of the light that features alternating milled out uh, flat surfaces as well as um, texture surfaces here. Now one thing is that right here on the edge it's not perfectly smoothed out. It's, it is a bit sharp. Not quite as sharp as say you know for those of you that recall uh, the TN11 that had those really really sharp um, I guess edges here that dug into the skin but likewise this one is semi sharp. It's not you know I would have liked to see them uh, file that down a little bit more. Now, rounding out the tail cap, there is no switch, right? Again, it's all the controls are solely through that side switch there, and um, it is perfectly flat, so it allows you know decent tail standing. And there is one mount for the lanyard here. Overall, I say it's a um, pretty handsome looking light. 
I guess, of course, that's subjective, and it does, you know, bear, of course, some family resemblance to their original 7G9, again, with that um, groove there, although the body is slightly different, no longer features this um, uh, oblong, um, no doubt, uh, groove here, but again, they, they aren't, uh, you would see the family resemblance when they are next to each other, side by side. Now getting the light unscrewed, you will see the battery carrier, which holds four cells in a 2S2P configuration. So what that simply means is that there are two cells in series, and then um, those two cells are wired in parallel with the other two cells, such that this pumps out 8.4 volts, um, instead of normally you would expect it to be 16.8 uh, volts, but it's not. It's actually 8.4 volts for the two cells. Now. Um, it is also wired with redundancy such that you can insert this either end um, because there are, again, redundant connections, positive tip connector here, negative here, and that functions um, the same as well. Now, because of this arrangement, this light can actually run on just two cells if need be. Now, case in point, I've got my uh, Fluke 289 here to help measure the uh, voltage, and as you can see, it's, um, again, close to 8.4. I used it up a little bit, so it's not exactly right at 8.4, either end. Now, getting back to the point about the redundancy, you would have to be a little mindful of, you know, checking to see which two are connected in series, and how that is typically um, denoted is that you would see the positive path connects directly to the negative path of the second cell. So that's how you know that this cell was up here. Now, having removed one set of cells, I could still get an 8.4 voltage reading from here. As you can see there, well again, close to 8.4, you get the idea. So to reiterate, this is in a 2S2P configuration. Now, this cell carrier is actually fairly um, uh, big in the sense that there is a lot of gap between the cells. So it's very roomy. I, I can't imagine any cell, uh, any standard 18650s um, having any fit issues. So as a case in point, I'm going to remove this and grab an XTAR 18700, which is my longest cells. And as you can see, there are no problems with fit. Likewise, there are no issues. There's um, good clearance for the tube itself so that there are no clearance issues when inserting the carrier. As a matter of fact, it, it may perhaps even be a bit loose such that it will cause some rattle um, once you do have it mounted on. Now to round off the, the light itself, uh, peering down the base of the tube, uh, that's actually a pretty a curious arrangement in the sense that you know I'm accustomed to seeing what should be normally one giant large spring, right, uh, carrying the, the negative path. but. In this case, though, they, they've actually got four springs here. Um, but I suppose that's not actually a bad thing because then that just means you have four separate contact points to conduct the, um, the negative path of the light. It's just I've, I've never seen it in this particular arrangement before. Now, these threads are not anodized nor are they square cut. And if there was one uh, particular, I would say, weak point of this light thus far that I've seen are these threads because they actually don't thread on very smooth, uh, even though they are amply greased. Now, at the base of the head, there is but that positive spring. And again, as you can see, there, the threads are not anodized. Now, one problem I have noticed with this light so far, and I don't know if it's particular to my sample, is the fact that even though I've had other lights with electronic switches, when you change the cells, um, the circuitry will know what was the last state and it will remain off. Now this circuitry actually does have memory functions as long as the battery is not changed. Once the battery is changed, it, it loses the memory. The um, strange thing about this is that as soon as I make connection and I breach that connection, because this isn't anodized, you know, you, A, you can't lock it out, and B, it makes contact immediately. So this actually turns the light on. So before you're able to screw this in, you know, I guess if you don't want to be blinded, you actually have to ensure that you have a good connection first and get this threaded on halfway and you just can hear there's that squeaking noise um, due to either the poor finish there or perhaps, I don't know if there's any grime there, but again, there is grease. It's just, it's not particularly smooth though. So you, again, so you want to mount this a little bit halfway, um, cycle through to shut off the light because it's always sequentially from high to low to off and then finally get the rest of the battery carrier back on. Fit and finish wise, the 7G10 is a very, very solidly built light. Uh, I mean, this thing is fairly tough. I could imagine it standing up to a fair amount of abuse 
um, with reasonably thick walls and, uh, like I said, just solid construction. Now, in terms of nitpicks, I would say that the bezel here, um, there's just a very tiny minute gap there. But of course, given that it's smooth and uh, I haven't actually been able to remove this, but potentially I'm going to try to put on a rubber and see if I could um, A, remove it and B, see if I could get that screw down further. But the anodizing, as I had previously mentioned, seems to have been bumped up a notch and over the 7G9. And that in turn itself was also a, a notch above um, its previous light. So I'm always very pleased to see companies making continued progress with their products. Now, as I had pointed out before, I don't like the fact that this um, tripod mount just seems to be misplaced, right? It should have been perhaps a little bit lower here, um, perhaps even to aid with a little bit of the uh, center of balance for the light. But overall, like I said, the anodizing is fairly solid. Um, don't really see any missing between the crevices here or even over the texture, uh, as well as over the edges. Now, also previously mentioned was the fact that this edge here is slightly sharp. I would have liked to have seen them um, file that down a little bit or, or smooth it down a bit. The switch itself operates with a very nice solid um, detent, right? So you could hear that, but it is fairly, it does require very little force. So I would say accidental activation is um, all but likely, uh, depending on how you store it or how you mount it. So you need to keep um, in mind. And the fact that you cannot lock out the light compounds that issue. In terms of laser engraving, they're all fairly nice and sharp. This is the only surface that bears any mark whatsoever. And there is no blotchiness. I like the fact that the lens has that nice rich um, AR coating and the greatest thing I've noticed about this is that that's not actually captured in the beam at all whatsoever. That beam is genuinely a pure neutral beam. On certain lights with this aggressive AR coating you actually do see that tint um, get uh, reflected out but in this case um, I actually do not see any blue, any hints of blue whatsoever in the beam. Now the final nitpick I would say was, pre as previously mentioned, the threads, they could stand to be a bit smoother or perhaps even anodize. Um, I guess I would prefer anodize obviously because that does generate the smoothest action. But either way though, it could definitely stand to be approved upon. But bottom line, this is a very nicely built light. So getting into the UI, I actually have the um, light off right now to prevent the uh, banding from the high contrast scene. But basically again, how it works in default mode is that it'll always cycle from high to low to off, right? So one click, high, one click, low, and another click, off. Now the camera is currently in auto white balance, so it's not gonna detect the beam profile uh, color or color correctly, which I'll get into a bit later. But continuing on with the UI is that both of those levels are actually able to be programmed. How that's done is that in either mode, in this case high, you would press, and hold on to it and it'll go through a ramping mode. Now once it reaches the bottom it'll kind of stall there for a second and then if you continue pressing it'll start ramping back up again and when it reaches max it'll flash a few times to let you know in which case you let go. So let's just go ahead and program that down back to minimum. <laughs> Okay, now this minimum I've actually measured. It's although the manufacturer claims does state that it could go from a low of one lumens. Uh, this is definitely not one lumens. This is closer to approximately thirty lumens or so. But that was a very rough estimate on my um, PVC LMD. I haven't actually gone to official measurements yet, but I'll put that into my written review. But suffice to say, this is not one lumens, All right? Likewise, when you cycle to the other mode, this low mode now seems bright by comparison because it's at 300 lumens. So we're going to go ahead and cycle that back up to max. So this way you could kind of reverse the pattern. So instead of um, high, low, off, you start off in low and then you go into high. <clears throat> Case in point, I've got it off now. Okay, this is a low of approximately 30 lumens or so. Max, off. It's a step up from the 7G5C as in that you could actually program um, both of the levels. And again, that gives you the option of going from you know low to high or high to low, depending on your preferences. There are two hidden modes. 
that are accessed through a double click at any point with the light off or on. And it will always engage STRO first and then SOS with another two clicks at any point you single click to um, disengage. So let's go ahead and activate the STRO first. Another two clicks to activate the SOS. And then as mentioned, at any time, you uh, single click to exit out of there and the hidden modes are not memorized. So meaning that you cannot set the SOS as the default. It'll always go into strobe, then SOS. Now to wrap up discussion of the UI, as previously mentioned, there is memory, meaning that these two modes are currently memorized, right? So you have low or min, you have max, and then off. It'll remember this for as long as the battery is not changed out. Once you disengage, meaning pass, at least because the threads are not anodized, you completely remove it to either exchange or uh, swap out the batteries, it will lose that and it'll default back to um, high, the low of 300 lumens, and then off. Beam profile. There may be a few of us thinking like, wow, that is um, gonna be a, mon a beast of a thrower because it's got that large diameter, deep reflector, 1600 lumens, but the problem is that, uh, first of all, A, there is a um, orange peel reflector, and B, is the fact that of that ginormous emitter, right? So you would actually need a larger and deeper reflector and smooth um, in order for this to be a monster thrower. Now, that's not to say that the MTG2 isn't capable of achieving that, um, perhaps just not um, currently, so at least not in this implementation. Now, the throw of this light is actually um, decent. It's just that if you're expecting a pencil thin beam, this does not do that, okay? This is more of a very nice giant hotspot with a um, decent transition from the hotspot to the spill. Now, this is on the minimum level of about 30 lumens, and I do have the um, shutter locked into 1 2,000th of a second and the aperture at f4.0. So as to underexpose to show you the beam, now that center donut that you're seeing is you know, obviously fairly exaggerated because of the current um, exposure settings. So let me go ahead and hit this into max. And here you see again, it is a fairly overall smooth beam. It does have a hot spot, but again, just not pencil beam thin, um, like say as on the XMM, and I even say that uh, tongue in cheek because XLM versus the XRE, X XRE would actually be even more pencil thin. There is a very faint ring out here that's not noticeable on the camera, but I could only imagine how much worse this could possibly be if this will happen a smooth reflector. So again, I'm very interested in seeing um, future iterations of this, but overall, that beam profile, especially that color, that color is just really, really nice. It is a very um, neutral, I would say, I wouldn't really say it's warm either. It is truly a, a very nice neutral, although probably on the camera it's showing up a little bit warm, but it is a very nice neutral. Now, by comparison, this is the 7G9 with the XML emitter. And that's another thing with the flat bezel. You obviously cannot see that the light is on right now, but anyway, here we go. So that on the left is the XML emitter. Of course, locked down so you actually don't even see any of the spill at all, but as you can see, it's not pencil beam thin, right? Meaning, sorry, meaning the MT-G2 you know, of the 7G10 is not pencil beam thin versus, let's say, the XML. Now, beam angle-wise, of course, this gets a little tricky with um, large diameter headlights because uh, you do have to angle the light down a little bit to kind of simulate what the projected um, correct angle would be. But I would say it's roughly about um, 30 degrees for the hot spot. And then in terms of, say, the, um, the spill, it's roughly 90 degrees. As an initial conclusion, I would say this is a very solid release from Curlant. I guess the only problem, though, is really the MTG was never really conceived for uh, flashlight you, especially for enthusiasts like us, because we typically want those, you know, overdriven uh, monsters that could pump out like, you know, 5,000 lumens at, you know, 10 ridiculous amount of amps or whatnot. But you gotta remember, keep in mind though, this LED was designed for home use, and the last thing they need is for a house to go up in flames because it, it's overdriven. So if I'm not mistaken, Cree's 
spec sheet actually rates this at 18 watts max, um, which divided by over 6 volts means you could really only have a maximum output of 3 amps. And then in this case, it's actually 8.4 amps, so you figure it's running roughly about just shy of, um, just over 2 amps, I should say. So it's not really being driven hard, although if you see um, fellow member, his name is Match, and if you look up his thread where he did some testing, he actually had this thing over 5 amps, and if I'm not mistaken, I think a few thousand lumens. I can't recall exactly, but if you just do a search for it, you will find his thread where he uh, tested it. Of course, he did have the um, emitter mounted to a copper slug, so that definitely helped things. But I feel that, to be honest with you, in its current application, it is being underutilized. I would really like to see um, the manufacturers take this to the next level and overdrive it a little bit just to see what it can do. But also, to be fair, manufacturers generally have very little lead time in terms of you know getting something out to market. While, again, the MTG2 is not a new emitter, but... Um, its use in a flashlight is, and in order to stay ahead of the competition, they just don't have a lot of time for QA. So they can't really push this to, say, the limits of 5 amps and just say, oh, well, throw it onto the market and let the uh, consumers QA it for us, right? So I actually do like the approach where, um, yes, it is a little conservative, but I'm excited at the prospects of uh, what the next iteration would bring. In its current iteration, it's not that it's not bad. It, like I said, it, it is. Um, I do like the beam profile a lot. That color is absolutely gorgeous. One of the best um, neutral colors I've seen on a light but you know if you're a, um, a lumen whore as they like to call it uh, you would like to see it bumped up a little bit now the design it's uh, of course that's subjective but overall I fairly like it I just don't like the placement of that again um, but overall it fits very nicely in the hand and um, overall even though it does have you know that nice uh, that huge head um, doesn't feel too unbalanced, right? Because, well, of course, it depends on where you grip it. So let's just say if you do an overhand grip, you could still operate the light with any of your, your fingers here. And because it does require very little force, um, it's very easy on the hands, especially if you have like carpal tunnel syndrome or some uh, wrist ailment or whatnot. But I, I really like this light. It's um, another nice solid release from Kalan. And as mentioned, I would like to see a, um, a harder driven model of this in the future. Of course, there are also considerations of when it, something is overdriven, you know, the warranty issues, um, potential warranty issues. So I, I don't blame manufacturers if they take a more um, conservative approach to output. So as a final thought, uh, very nice, Krillon. Let's see some more, man. And that concludes this review. Although I did mention earlier as part of FTC disclosures, the Krillon 7G10 was provided by md-lightsource.com for review. Thanks again for watching.